So we're talking this, this month, we're starting our, our new summer series, Launching the Gospel. But before that, I want to take this time to, to, to say thank you. I want to say thank you first and foremost. Last week, we had a work be in this church. And it was an amazing exercise. No, you don't understand the coordination that happened. We, had, we rent on Sunday to Cornerstone, and there was a wedding that was happening that day here. And so the team got together, they worked, they cleaned, they painted, and, 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 and no one got hurt. <laughs> the wedding happened, the church happened, and we are getting ready, and I believe, I haven't received the report yet, but we did all this because we received a fire inspection report. And they were giving us till August to rectify certain things. And I want to publicly thank Carlisle Raymond, who is our safety officer. He is the one that's coordinating, making sure that we're in charge. As a matter of fact, I was at a pastor's retreat. And the conference said, if the church wants to save $5,000 a year, have a safety officer. So, hey, we are saving $5,000. We got a safety officer. And we have an evacuation plan. And so, Carlisle, if you're here or if you come to the second service publicly, I want to thank you. Everyone that was here, thank you, thank you, thank you for making this happen. Second person I want to thank publicly is my boss, my boss. Where's Joan Ramsey? Joan Ramsey. Joan, where are you, Joan? Come on. There you go. She's, she's being shy. She is not the secretary of the church. Do not call her that. She's not the secretary of the church. She's my boss. <laughs> She's actually the office administrator, and I want to thank her publicly because those connect cards that you see, that you, some of you have been answering, she's the one that does it weekly. She prints them out, and she personalizes and puts them in the pew holders right there every week. Every Friday, she does that, and I want to thank her, and I want to thank you guys who have participated. We've gotten some information. We don't have all the information that we need, but today... Uh, hopefully, Joan, I got a surprise for you. I got a surprise for you. I didn't tell you. Today probably is the last time that we're going to use the Connect card. And she's like, praise Jesus. <laughs> okay? Because third person I want to thank, and I don't know if he's here, is Pastor Nelson. I want to thank Pastor Nelson. Pastor Nelson, man, he completes me. <laughs> you don't understand. Uh, Steve, I heard you. I heard you. He said, Pastor, why don't you automate this? Why don't you make this, you know? Why do we have to write the card? So, Steve, I heard you. And so me and Nelson, we got together, and Nelson put this together. So today, we're going to have a QR code. You're going to take out your phones. You're going to take out your phones, the camera, and you're going to point it on the screen, and the Connect card will magically appear on your phone. Wow. And not only that, Joan, ready for this? Joan, the information is going to be sent to you through Planning Center. No more sitting there on Monday, you know, reading the cards, deciphering the handwritings. No, 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 no. So I want to I thank you in advance for helping us. We're trying to get information. By the way, the Connect cards do work. We have over 35 people that signed up for Bible studies. Over 20 people that said they want to give Bible studies. And every week... A couple of numbers, I think it was last week, I saw last week's report, four people gave their hearts to Jesus Christ. They want to be baptized. And we get that every week. So we don't want to, the connect cards do work, but I want to make it easier for you now. Take out the excuses. You have a phone. We're going to use our QR. You're going to use it to help us with this information. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Last announcement, last announcement on Tuesdays. Those Bible studies that I mentioned, some of you signed up for Bible studies. And what I've learned in class, the days of the one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, those days are over. It was found that when you do one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, what happens is that you become dependent on that person giving you the Bible study. And so that person becomes your crutch. And so what, what, what they're saying now in discipleship is to be, study in groups, like Sabbath school. This is nothing new to us. And so all of you who signed up for Bible studies and all of you who will continue to sign up for Bible studies, I want to let you know, we're going to offer this on Tuesdays at 730 and during prayer meeting. Prayer meeting is going to take another, we're going to change it a bit. We're going to worship together. We're going to pray together. 
But those of you who signed up for Bible studies, we're going to divide ourselves. It will be like Sabbath school, and we're going to study the Bible. So I know Joan sent you an email asking you what do you want to study because I have some people like Paulo who said, Pastor, count me in. I'm going to be one of the instructors. So we're going to be a church that studies the word. Amen, amen. So that's going to happen Tuesdays and Wednesdays. All right, so let's jump in. Father God, thank you for allowing us to be here. I thank you for the people that have served this church, serve you, Father. I thank you, Father, for the wisdom and the experience that's in this room. But Father, we want to thank you for the gospel. And as we jump into this topic, Father, I pray that you may hide me behind the cross. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And with that, I want to say this. I want to remind you, if when any of us are preaching, any of us are preaching, if there's something that we said that is not clear, or if you're unsure, or if you have a question, or you even have a comment, talk to us. Send us an email. From now on, I, I'm going to stay here in the front. So if you, hey, pastor, you said this, can you clarify? Because believe it or not, I do make mistakes. It happens sometimes. You know, notice I don't have notes in front of me. My outline is the slides, and God just gives me what he's about to give me. But sometimes I may misread what he tells me. So do not leave here with a doubt or question or, or something that I said. Let's talk. Amen, amen? Especially this month as we talk about the gospel. So we're talking this month about launch, and that's our theme. Our theme is launch. And when we're talking about launch, we're talking about starting or setting something in motion, whether an activity or an enterprise. So a couple of weeks ago, Brandon, we celebrated and we recognized the 50th year of, of, of the astronauts being in landing on the, on the moon. And so it's special for me because yesterday was my parents' anniversary. So yesterday, my parents celebrated 50 years married. And, and they don't know this, and I'm, I'm going to tell you something. They don't know this. And so my parents were not Christians when they got married. And so they did not have a wedding at church. They're going to be here next week. <laughs> so I'm going to have them renew their vows in front of you. Amen, amen. My wife was Linda. She's like, okay, preparate. Because <laughs> my mommy, ¿por qué te hiciste eso? Because I'm the pastor. <laughs> but it's special for me because my parents always tell me, every year they tell me, you know, in our honeymoon, the ast while we were in our honeymoon, the astronauts were playing on the moon. That was their joke for years, so that's how I make the connection. But Balls Aldrin, something that you may not have known, when, 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 I'm not saying that. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin, while he was up there, he said this. Houston, this is Eagle, the LM pilot speaking. I would like to request a few moments of silence. Over. I would like for each person listening in, whenever and wherever you may be, to contemplate for a moment the events of the past few hours and to give thanks in his own individual way. My way shall be by partaking of the elements of Holy Communion. And so, this is what he's telling them. And so, while, while he's doing this, Neil Armstrong is looking at him, and, and he was one of the first to have those little cups and little wafers. They pilot that with Bulls Aldrin. And so, he took communion. Now, they couldn't vocalize this over the, over the TV, right? So there was a moment of silence. But in the cockpit, while he's partaking of communion, Buzz Aldrin read this. And this is, these are his handwritten notes. He says, I, and Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, I in him, will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. He said that. And then he went on to read Psalms 1.8. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which them has ordained, what is man that thou art mindful, mindful of him, and the son of man that thou shalt visit him. So even though none of us heard those words, Buzz 
whispered that in space, remembering his creator. Now, while I'm talking about that, why am I saying that? Because we're talking this month about launching the gospel. And if we were to ask you the question, what is the gospel? Many of you will have different interpretations. The word gospel is not a religious word. It's, it was a political word. It's, it's in the Greek, you on, you and, euangelion. Euangelion means good news. Euangelion was a word that was used by the conquerors. So if the Romans came to Miami and conquered Miami, they would send someone to say, you, get, you Gillian, you and Gillian, not Gilligan, you and Gillian, gospel, Rome has conquered Miami. That was the good news. But see, that good news was only one-sided, right? It's like the doctor, this patient went to see the doctor, and the doctor says, I have good news and I have bad news. You ever had that situation? So he says, give me the good news. The doctor says, good news? You have 24 hours to live. He's like, that's the good news? What's the bad news? Bad news is I called you yesterday. That's the bad news. Perspective. 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 Not beating up on the, pa- on the, on the doctors, let's beat up on the pastor. So a pastor went away on vacation, and the elder says, hey, pastor, the attendance and the tithes and offering has gone up the past three weeks. What's the bad news? Well, you were on vacation for the past three weeks. When are you going back on vacation? Anyway, you and Gillian, good news. The good news, the good news was one-sided. It was for the side that won. So for Pastor Nelson, I'm sorry to say the Yankees won yesterday. Just saying, let's move on. Let's move on. So anyway... When I posted the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? On Facebook, a millennial, his name is Adam. He answered me privately and he gave me this long answer, but this is what he said. So many times, the Christian definition of good news isn't good news for all. It's only good news for who? And for Adventists. And we're gonna, I'm going to explore that a bit in a bit, but I want to remind you. When Jesus came to this earth and the angels proclaim euangelion, gospel, look what it says. And I bring you euangelion, gospel of great joy that will be for who? All the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. That message was not just for the Jews. It was for everyone. So what is the gospel? Here's one definition. The gospel is the good news that God became man in Christ, Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving that he is the son of God and offering the gift of salvation to all who repent and believe in him. Woo, that's a mouthful. Here's the other definition. Gospel. If you take the gospel, the acrostic, the G stands for God created us to be with him. Amen. He's our creator. Our sins separate us from God. Sin cannot be removed by our good deeds. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Everyone who trusts in him alone has what? And I love the last part. Life with Jesus starts when? And lasts forever. Many Christians believe that eternal life is when Jesus comes. Or if you, go to, if you belong to another denomination, it's when you die and you go to heaven. But no, 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 no. Here's another definition of the gospel. Where God himself has come to rescue and renew all creation through the work of Jesus. Timothy Keller says this. The gospel's power is seen in its ability to completely change minds, hearts, life, orientation, our understanding of everything that happens, the way people relate to one another and so on. Most of all, it is powerful because it does what no other power on earth can do. It can save us. It can reconcile us to God and guarantee us a place in the kingdom of God forever. Amen? Okay, but let me, let me push you. Let me push you. 
if you could have heaven with no sickness, with all your family and friends you ever had on earth, and all the food you ever liked, and all the leisure activity you ever enjoyed, and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict or any natural disaster, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ was not there? Be careful, because your Christian side is saying, yeah, of course, amen. But what does your daily life say? What does your daily life say? Is, 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 is the first thing in the morning, is it Jesus? Is the last thing Jesus? Is during the day Jesus? Or do you just turn on the Christian music, you turn on the, the quarterly, you open up the lesson on Friday night, and you hear on church listening to a sermon, opening your Bibles, yeah, because you're Seventh-day Adventist and you keep the Sabbath, you think that you're part of the remnant. Hello, somebody. Because see, the question is, and this is what John Piper says, if we don't want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. So the first foundation, and we're going to spend all month talking about this, but the first foundation I want to leave you is this. Paul and Barnabas just finished healing a paralytic in the book of Acts. And all of a sudden, they wanted to follow him. They said, oh, you are Zeus and you are Hermes. And Paul turns around and says, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Turn from these vain things to a living God. The first thing I want to lay out for you about the gospel is that we serve a living God. The gospel is, is, is about turning away from everything else that you have put as God in his place. And some of us have placed Adventism in the place of God. First thing, foundation, the gospel. God is alive. We serve a living God, and he created us. So now, what makes the gospel the good news? So here it is, real quick. When I was growing up, this is what I used to hear. Okay, the gospel, the gospel is I accept Jesus, and that means I don't burn in the lake of fire. Right? Remember that? Even the amazing fact lessons, all of that, you know, the, the revelation seminars, the gospel was if you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will not go into the lake of fire. Or how about this one? The good news is, woo, I don't have a guilty conscience. I have relief. I, I, I have been forgiven of my sins. So here's the thing. Forgiven. So is the good news something that you are avoiding or is the gospel the good news because you're getting something we're talking about forgiveness and that's one of the main ingredients of the gospel so let me allow let me allow me with an illustration and this is not for my personal life okay this is not so i got my wife looking at me this is not the, the names have not been changed because it's not my story got it all right but let's pretend Let's pretend that I wake up in the morning, I'm heading to the bathroom, and I trip over the laundry. And it's not the first time. I've said it over and over. The laundry, dirty clothes, does not go on the floor. It goes in the hamper. So I turn around. My wife, my wife is sleeping. And I yell at her. How many times I can tell you the hamper, the clothes go in the hamper, da, 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 da. And my wife gets up without saying a word, picks up the clothes, throws them in the hamper. And then she walks away. She goes downstairs. Uh, the husband realizes, man, I think I was a little rough. I think I was a little harsh. So he goes downstairs and he tries to make it up. And the wife says, talk to the hand, right? I don't want to hear you. 
And now the wife is giving him the silent treatment. And all of a sudden now, there is a rift between husband and wife. Now the husband wants forgiveness. Right? Amen? But why does he want forgiveness? Is it because the wife is in the kitchen, it's morning, and he wants his favorite breakfast? Or does he want forgiveness because, uh-oh, the kids are awake and, and we don't want to, you know, you know, we don't want them to see that, you know, the tension between us. Or you feel guilty and you know that like going to work, this thing is going to mess with you. You know, I should have not screamed. I should have been more gentle, blah, 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 right? Or you were thinking of having a romantic evening that night and you just realized that there's no tuki tuki. You know what I'm saying? By the way, Tuki Tuki. <laughs> real quick, real quick. It was a Cuban. I was giving a Bible study, and he was using the word Tuki Tuki. Like, you know, my wife is always Tuki Tuki, Tuki Tuki, Tuki Tuki. So I took it to mean something else. So I'm just, just. So, is that the reason why you want forgiveness? Or is it because you want the relationship to be restored? Hello, husbands, what's the answer? Now, by the way, by the way, by the way, I got you, Wilney, got you, got you. If this happens, will the tuki tuki happen? Will, will the guilt go away? Will, will, will the children be happy? Will he get his favorite breakfast? Yes. But the reason why we want forgiveness is not for all those things. It's for the relationship to be what? So... Your relationship with God, when you mess up and when you want forgiveness from God, why is it that you want forgiveness from God? Is it because you're fearing that one day, if you have not confessed all your sins, that you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire? Or you feel guilty and you don't want to have a guilty conscience? Or do you want forgiveness because you want the relationship to be restored? That is part of what the gospel means. See, the gospel is not about getting people to heaven. The gospel is not about getting people to heaven. The gospel is about getting people to God. And how do you get people to God? And I'm gonna see, I, I see Mr. McMillan, Pastor McMillan, Pastor McMillan, how do we get to God? We get to God through Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the gospel is about Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen, I got you. I got you. That is the beauty of the gospel. It's not so much that we're saved by sin and he died for us and he resurrected. The fact is that Jesus loves us. He created us. He wants to renew us in his image. This is in a relationship with him. Martha's not here, but I love what she said. She hit the home run. She says the gospel is this. It's the gift of eternity with God. Nothing we have to do. We could not have acquired it ourselves. It was a gift freely given. We're able to enjoy a relationship with God our Father forever. That relationship avail is available today. Eternity starts when? And the verse is, and this is eternal life, that they may know who? Jesus whom you sent. Let me remind you, remind you, John Piper says again, if we don't want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. So do you understand why Pastor Nelson and I, we said, man, we, we got to teach, we got to talk about this. Because the Adventism that I grew up, and many of you grew up, was that God is our judge. And yes, he's our judge. I'm not taking that away. But they did not explain to me that God loves me. That God wants to have a relationship with me now. The problem with Adventism is too into the future, the second coming of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. And we, and we place that, oh, that's back there. That's far, far away. But Jesus says, no, 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 no. The kingdom of God is here, he said. And he says, I want you and I to have a relationship right now, right here, because that's the way the world is going to fall in love with me because they see you having a relationship with me. 
So what, it, what makes the good news the good news? What makes the gospel the good news? The gospel isn't just about your salvation, your assurance, and your eternal life. The gospel also addresses the purpose, the cause that will serve as your life's motivation. I want to remind someone today, God called you. God called the broken, God called the weary, God called the sin-scarred, the corrupted, the abused, the poor. God called the lowly, the lonely, the rejected, the despised, the messed up, the used up, the thrown out. He's called everyone to him. Glory, hallelujah. He's not expecting you to be clean to come to him. He says, come to me as you are. Notice, and I challenge you. See, this is one of the things I'm, I'm going to say. And some of you are like, oh, wait a minute, pastor. Let's talk afterwards. But I challenge you, nowhere in the gospel do you hear God say, come to me for healing. But he healed. Hello, somebody. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, come to me for forgiveness. But he forgave. The only thing God calls us to do is into a relationship with him to go and make what? Disciples. He says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The call of Jesus is the call to learn from him. What are we learning from him? Well, how did Jesus was able to live a sinless life? Oh, he modeled that for us. Can we do that? Yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hello, somebody. Some of us keep making excuses. Well, you know, God understands. I am a sinner, blah, blah, blah. Stop making excuses. Because the life of Christ was a model for us to learn from him, to learn of him, then to take that knowledge to others who don't know him. As I close, Isaiah was reminding us, Jesus is truly God. In Isaiah chapter 40, it's amazing, Isaiah chapter 40, God inspired the prophet Isaiah to talk to the Israelites who were in captivity. They were in Babylon. And notice what he's telling them while they are in captivity. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her. What are you going to say? That her warfare is ended. Wait a minute. They were in captivity. What? what? Their captivity is ended. Her iniquity is pardoned. And that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sin. Verse 3, it says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for your God. Who's that talking about? Who's that talking about? It's talking about John the Baptist, but it's also talking about us. We are to prepare the way for people to know. What are they going to know? What are they going to know? Every valley shall be exalted. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. The uneven shall be made level. The rough places are plain. The Lord's glory shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. All flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the fields. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. But listen to me, the grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of the Lord will what? And this is the point. This is the point. Verse 9, he says, you are to bring the gospel to Zion, to go up on a high mountain. You who bring the gospel to Jerusalem, lift up with your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns, here is your God. And that applies to us too. We are to go out there and cry to the world, hey, it's not that Jesus is coming. Jesus came and he's here. He's abiding in us and he wants you to be part of his kingdom. And yes, he's coming back, but he wants to have a relationship with you right now. Behold, here is your God. See, the gospel is not just our ticket into heaven. It's to be an entirely new basis for how we relate to God, ourselves, and others. It is to be the source from which everything else flows. So what are you doing? Every once in a while, it may be good to remind yourself that the salvation is for a purpose. It's to prepare the way of the Lord, to join in God's great kingdom work 
You are saved to join with others in removing obstacles and smoothing the ways for the message of Jesus to get to the, do the heart of those who don't know him. As Wilney said last week, to reach the younger brothers. The younger brothers that have left our church, the younger brothers that are in the world, it is our responsibility to say, hey, behold, your God. He loves you. He has a plan for you. Paul says, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My own aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus giving me. Notice what's his task. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. That is all of our responsibility. But here's the cool thing as we continue reading the verse. He says, behold, this is your God. Then he turns and says, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are young. Jesus is saying to us, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The gospel is not about what Jesus did for you for salvation. He is also your shepherd here and now. Here and now, he's your shepherd. You need to go to him. My sister, my daughter is in town, and she reminded me. <clears throat> when I was in college, I was living on my own, and I was working, I was studying, and I was stressed out because I didn't have enough money to pay the rent. And so my father called me. He says, hey, how you doing? And he's talking to me, and he noticed that there was something in my voice that was a little, was a little off. And he was like, ¿Qué te pasa? What's going on? Ah, oh, no, no, papi, no, no, no. What's going on? I said, Pop, you know I'm working, you know I'm studying, you know I'm doing this, but I'm short of the rent. And I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to bother you because you, you have your bills, you, you, you're dealing with Cynthia who's still in high school. I didn't want to bother you. And my father stopped me. He says, Mira, I am your father. And even though you are in Texas and I'm in New York, you're studying, I am still your father. And it is my responsibility to take care of you. And if I don't have the money, you don't worry about that. I am your father. I will find the money. But you had to come to me and tell me. And as we're talking about this, I remembered, wow, that's God with us. How many times has Pastor Lafitte have been trying to do it on his own and trying to do a lot of things for God's kingdom and I get stressed out and I get overwhelmed and God says to me, hey, I'm your father. I'll take care of you. The gospel is saying this, come unto me all who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Desire of Ages says, come unto me is his invitation. Whatever your anxieties, whatever your trials, spread out your case before the Lord. Your spirit will be braced for endurance. The way will be open for you to dis distangle yourself from embarrassment and difficulty. The weaker and more helpless you know yourself to be, the stronger you will become in his strength. The heavier your burdens, the more blessed the rest in casting them upon the burden bearer. That's the good news. He's my God. He's my king. He's my shepherd. So as I close with this story. The Americans were, in World War II, some were held as POWs behind the German camps. And so the Americans were behind the barbed wire, and the captors, the Germans, were on the other side enjoying life. And all of a sudden, the captors noticed that the prisoners were smiling, and they were happy. And they, they, they couldn't understand. <laughs> They're not eating. They're not bathing. They, 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 why are they smiling? The story goes is that there was a soldier. Ah! There was a POW who brought in a shortwave radio. And he heard the news. The Americans have broken through. They have defeated the Germans. And so they're smiling. Because even though they're still in captivity, even though their situation hasn't changed, even though the barbed wire is in front of them, they receive the good news. Victory is coming. Come on, church. Our situation here on earth may have not changed. You are probably behind barbed wires, probably addiction, probably death and, and bills all over you. But can I remind you, the king came. Your God has already given you the victory. 
You have to allow the gospel to launch within you. You have to embrace it for yourself. Many of you know the Adventist doctrines, and you will defend it, and in a minute you're going to go to Sabbath school, and you're going to go into the finer points. But I dare you, you don't know the king. Because if that was the case, your first breath in the morning would be for Jesus. The breath during the day would be Jesus. The last thing you do is Jesus. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, the good news is not that there is no pain or death or sin or eternal punishment. There is. The good news is that Jesus, the king himself, has come. Jesus is the good news. Jesus is the gospel. If we don't want God above all things, if we don't want Jesus above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. Amen? So, take out your phones. Take out your phones. I'm going to have the deacons. If you don't have the phones, for those of you who don't have your phones, then there's the connect cards. There you go. The connect cards are for you. Open up the camera. There's going to be a, a little thing. You click on it, and it's going to open up the connect card for you. You like that, Steve-O? You like that? Ah. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to fill it out. I want you to fill it out. I want you to fill it out. But here's, here's, here's the thing. There's some steps. There's some steps that I want you to consider. Step number one. Is Jesus your God and King today? I want you to select one. Some of you always select like three or four. No, no. These are steps for you. Maybe I'm talking to someone who's visiting for the first time. Is Jesus today your king today? The second, the second one, the second one is do you want to surrender your life to him? Do you want him to lead your life in everything? And the last one, the last one, do you want to cry out and say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is here. Okay? That's part of the four. Okay? That's your commitment that you're making towards God. I'll appreciate if you can help me. If you don't have your phones, please fill out the connect cards. Uh, that's an Android? Okay, well, huh? <laughs> well, we tested it, and, and for some of you, we, we tested it. We didn't test it in the Android, but if you open up the camera, the camera, you, you, you focus on it, and it will open up the QR reader. It used to be the case where you have to, but hey, there's, there's, we'll work on it, okay? Some of you it worked, some of you did it, and if it doesn't work, there's the connect card in front of you, okay? The connect card in front of you. But my friends, we'll leave it up. We'll leave it up. Point is this. Who's Jesus to you? Pastor Nelson will continue this conversation next week. We'll continue this conversation at prayer meeting. But I want to challenge you. The good news is not escaping hell. The good news is not having a, a, a peaceful conscience. The good news is that Jesus loves us. He came died and he wants to have a relationship with you today and so at this time we're going to sing the deacons will collect your offering your tithes and offering which is your act of worship so I want to remind you that there are different ways of giving one of the ways that we want to encourage you is to use the online app. That's one way, online giving. But at this time, this is your also your way of worship where you give God, you're returning to God his tithes and his offering.